have the privilege of having back a guest that I had on a previous episode, Dr. Lark Eshelman, who is an author, a therapist, an educator, and her expertise is working with kids and teens who have experienced early emotional trauma and attachment difficulties. And she's also the creator of STAT, which is Synergistic Trauma and Attachment Therapy. And Dr. Lark's experiences as a school principal, psychologist, librarian, parent, and in her own childhood have all really shaped her pioneering work in providing families, teachers, therapists, and institutions with the necessary understanding and tools to support young people on their healing journeys. Um, And because we have had a conversation before, it felt very natural to invite her back because it was such a lovely first experience that uh, I was excited to to ask and she said yes. So uh, Lark is with us again, but this time we're going to be talking about anxiety. So we're pivoting a little bit from um, the the primary focus of our conversation last time around attachment and trauma. And now we're going to look more uh, uh, closely at the nature of anxiety and problematic anxiety and how to know the difference. Sometimes that's really tricky to be able to tell. So we're going to tease a few things apart in this episode. Um, before we begin our conversation, I'll, I'll kind of give you a, a, a map for where we're headed. One of the things we really wanted to tease apart was the difference between what we would call situational and biologically based anxiety. So we're going to try and tackle that first. And we're going to talk a little bit about what about when number one becomes number two? So what about when it may be starts as situational? Can it, can it um, convert into something that feels more biologically based. And then the third thing uh, we're going to talk about is how the heck are you supposed to know the difference between feeling anxious, because that's supposed to happen for us at times, and having a full-on anxiety disorder. And so uh, we have a lot to cover, and we might just split this up into two episodes. We'll see how this conversation goes. But Lark, welcome back. Thanks for coming. Oh, thank you, Karen. It's just fun to be back with you because you're just a natural. You get it and you ask the right questions and you give me a chance to ramble a little, which of course I love to do uh, about these topics that can be very straightforward, but also are very often much more um, uh, detailed, intricate, somewhat convoluted, and we need to be really careful to make sure that we're being clear. And I hope that at the end of our time together, whether it's part one or part two, or if we just just kind of plow through the whole thing right now is that we talk about what we can do about it, how we can yeah. help. And and Karen, are we focusing on kids or are we talking about anxiety across the board? Just so well, I, I think that's, yeah, let's focus on kids, but I think it's kind of a false line because we mm-hmm. as parents, because this is a topic around how we're parenting our kids with anxiety, it brings up our own stuff. And so it's good Very for good us point. to be bringing that in where it's applicable. So I'm open to wherever that boundary sits. But I think, yeah, primarily we want to help equip parents and understanding like what's going on for my poor kiddo. You know, they're not thriving and there's something I wish I could do differently and I don't know how to approach it. Um, Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. So let's begin then with that first clarification. We need to really understand what separates situational anxiety from biologically based anxiety. Can you describe those two? What makes them unique? Yes. And I hope you you don't um, find this offensive in any way, but I'm going to say that both are biological. So I, I want to I mm-hmm. just say that they both come from our biology and they both are in our neurology and that's how our neurology responds to certain situations. Yes. Um, either uh, gener- in a generalized way, which is the diagnosis that we use is generalized anxiety disorder for the mm-hmm. type that is everything. We just feel anxious all the time, no matter what the situation is, no matter what's yeah. going on, we can't come back from that feeling. And yeah. that's the generalized anxiety disorder, which of course is biological, but it is um, also a, a, a pervasive Um, biological response. It happens all the time with anything regardless of or irrespective of triggers. The other situational is, again, biological, but it is our biological response to certain things that make us anxious. Mm -hmm. But when those certain things are not there, 
or staring at us, or we're not anticipating that they're going to happen. Like, oh my gosh, um, I'm I'm going to a party. I won't know anybody. I won't know what to say. I won't know what to do. I might look stupid. I might yeah. not know anybody there. That situational anxiety will go away either if you decide to not go to the party or afterwards once you're there and somebody comes up to you and says, um, gosh, I'm glad you're here. Come on over and let's talk to some friends. And then you take a deep breath and you can relax. So one is, and I know why you use the term biological because you're right. It's generalized anxiety disorder is imprinted in your nervous system. Mm-hmm. And that is your set point or that right. is your, um, where you live. Yeah. And when I, when I try to help kids understand the difference, I might say to them, you know how you play tag and you, you run to the tree that's going to be your safe place and you say home free or whatever term you use for that. And yeah. you can take a deep breath and you're like, I'm safe here. I'm not going to get caught. Mm-hmm. If you don't have that, mm-hmm. then most likely you have a generalized anxiety disorder that doesn't allow you to ever come back from that place of just being worried about everything, being anxious yeah. about everything. And so it's it kind of takes yeah. over your whole brain and nervous system. I love how you describe the difference. So when I, you know, I get, if, if I'm trying to clarify the terms, uh, maybe it's what I'm thinking of is like it, all anxiety is physiological. So we exactly. feel it physically, right? And then the biological piece is more like we are born into the, we are wired in to have a different set point, which I love okay. that. How, that's how you describe that, right? Situational yeah. is like, it brings us out of our set point into an anxious place. And then we Ooh, feel that physiologically, yeah. right? Okay, it removes yeah. us from our normal set point. Yeah, right. those are very different experiences, isn't it? If you never really feel are. like you can come back to ground zero that feels steady. Right, that, and you know, when you yeah. study um, early development, and you meet those kids who really never were safe. They yep. may have had, they may have had uh, the 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 makings of or the precursors of an anxiety disorder in utero. Yeah, because this is something that happens when you just don't feel uh, like you can take that deep breath and say, "Oh, everything's good." Mm-hmm. These are kids who may have drug or alcohol in their system. Mother may be very anxious. And so her hormones, which are the ones that allow us to be anxious. Anxiety is a good thing. Let's let's back up for a sec. Yeah. Anxiety yeah, yeah. is a really good thing. We need to have it because it's the thing mm-hmm. that protects us and keeps us alive. Yeah. So if we were not anxious, then when we saw a rabid dog running towards us, mm-hmm. we wouldn't run away. Yeah. So we need to be anxious and it's a good thing. It's when it's a constant, steady and um, hormonal uh, response that just keeps us in that place all the time. Yeah, That's when we see those kids, and I used to see them once in a while in school when I was a principal or a school psychologist, Mm -hmm. that there were those kids who could just never... Drop the shoulders, yep, yep. Couldn't do it. And it's very sad to see. Yeah, isn't it? It's Struggling hard now. to watch that energy stuck in a kid's yeah. body. Yeah, stuck and stuck is the word. Stuck is yeah. it, it's the it's the perfect word, Karen, because mm-hmm. these kids are stuck. Mm-hmm. It's not their choice. It's not that they have no. decision making about it. They're stuck right. there. Yeah. Until we intervene, and we can, and it is a treatable mm-hmm. disorder. So I'm glad we can get that up front. So people yep. don't feel like, oh, I'm not going to listen to this. Yeah, this is a forever game. <laughs> There's nothing game. we can do about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no sense listening. It's just doom and gloom. No, it right. is a very treatable disorder. And yeah. the generalized anxiety part is the one that is, um, it's diagnosed in the manual, the di- um, mm. Diagnostic and Statistical Manual or DSM, which is the code book that we use, as you know. So yeah. Um, so that you can go into the doctor, you can have testing, we can talk about this later if you want, but mm-hmm. um, the doctor or whoever, the therapist, should be able to diagnose that with set of criteria and yeah. distinguish it from situational anxiety, which is not a formal disorder. It's something that happens mm-hmm. to all of us. 
mm-hmm. from time to time. But if you can come back from it yeah. and it's paired with certain situations, like speaking in front of people, a lot yeah. of people have that situation yeah. anxiety, yeah. then you're, you know, you're able to make the distinction and treat. Yeah. I can see why it's fuzzy when you're a parent just watching a human being on its own, right? There's, there's yeah. nothing to compare it to, but you sense that maybe there's a, a really heightened sensitivity to certain situations. So that's mm-hmm. when we often will say, I have a really anxious kid or mm-hmm. I have a super shy child or I have a right. really, she really has a struggle with a lot of things that have to do with other people or it's, so it doesn't just feel super narrow or contained to public speaking, for instance, or um, around dogs or, you know, it's like not really narrow. And as soon as it broadens, it starts to kind of take shape like it feels like it's happening so often for so many situations, it feels generalized or it looks like it's all the time. And that's where being a parent is tough, tough work. Right. Because yeah. if you if you're concerned if you're concerned enough that you're going to go seek help for this, mm-hmm. you are going to be asked questions that will re- you'll end up scratching your head. If you have yep. a child who seems to be generalized, generalizably anxious, I don't know what the exact right mm-hmm. term is. If they yeah. seem to always be anxious, yeah, and you are asked the question, well, really, is it all the time? Mm-hmm. Can they go to sleep? Are they? Um, very jumpy? Do they have certain characteristics of generalized anxiety? And you say, Mm -hmm. well, yes, uh, but mm, not 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, then let's start teasing it out. So if you are a parent who is concerned, it would be a good good thing to check that out, to be on the lookout for when it is that my child shows the worst of this. Yeah. And you know what, Karen, the other thing is we talk about this a lot in psych and I think it's very frustrating for parents because it's like, really, you're going to say this again, but it's true. Mm-hmm. There is a kind mm-hmm. of a norm, which is uh, in the middle, but it's, there's a range in the middle. Yeah, that's right. And then there are the real outliers on one side or the other. Yeah. So you may have a yeah. child who seems like they may even have a generalized anxiety disorder because it's so often, but they may be on the fringe. And it may be that if you do certain things at home, Mm -hmm. which again, I'll talk about, or we can talk about at the end. um, Yeah. If you try these things and they help, Mm -hmm. oh, well, then maybe we can get a handle on this without having to go full on diagnostic of generalized anxiety disorder. It's tricky business I also think about timeline. It is tricky business. It's very foggy, yeah. right? Nothing yeah. is as clear as any book will tell you. But when you, you when when like I think another another clarifying question to ask yourself is, has my child always been this way? So even though they, it's very thick and generalized looking right now, about all the things, maybe this started last school year. Or maybe this, right? So something has shifted that caused that child to feel they had to be hypervigilant or eyes open wide all the time. Whether or not it's rational, it doesn't matter. It's perceived. Then that can put a child in a state of looking like they're in generalized anxiety because it, yes, the whole world feels all of a sudden unsafe, but maybe for the first 10 years it didn't. Right. And, you know, that may be the question that a lot of parents are asking themselves right now as we're near the end, I hope, of COVID. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I feel like I may have said that the last time and we aren't there Mm -hmm. yet. But the last time we spoke. But if children were not particularly anxious before or maybe showed it a little but not a lot. And now they seem to be anxious about everything pretty much all the time. Yeah. Now we get to that place where we talk about situational anxiety kind of blending into or or easing into um, that whole generalized anxiety situation. Some kids have it from the time they're born. Some kids learn it. It becomes um, their state of being because they're in that mode of being anxious so much of the time that their brain says, oh, I guess this is the way I'm supposed to be. That's right. Yeah. It's adapting. I guess I just it's adapting get, um, to the environment. Adapt. That's right. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. because if you think about it, if um, our nervous system is supposed to be on set point 
to keep us safe. And constantly for the last two years or so, they've been feeling maybe it's not so safe or mm -hmm. whatever the situation is going on at home or at school or wherever they're, wherever they are. Um, they're, they learn, we live what we learn and what they are learning is the world isn't a very safe place. Yeah. yeah. Poor kids. I know. By the way, the, the statistics right now are through the roof and I have been oh. following them as they've been aggregated uh, pretty much around the world. <clears throat> what are we seeing? We're seeing double and triple numbers of anxiety Ooh. and depression among children and, and mm -hmm. teens. It's very worrying because, you know, the longer these kids stay in this state, yeah, uh, the more chance that they're going to, that situational uh, anxiety is going to yeah. become pervasive or generalized anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. And also because there is a real lack, a real dearth, anybody who's out there looking for good therapists or good psychiatrists or good mm -hmm. pediatricians who can really nail it and help it, few and far between right now. We've lost yeah. so many, not necessarily to death, although we have lost some wonderful people to yeah. COVID, um, but a lot of people have just said, I can't do this anymore. And so they're yeah. leaving the field. Yeah. It's tough. And the rest, really the rest of those of us who continue to do the work, I'm sending 15 people away a week. Yeah. That was not pre-COVID, right? So the demand and the availability, it's just not right. even near a match. Um, it's, I know this, like watch, get trying to find new therapists for my kids in the last couple of years has been the same struggle. Everybody comes back. Sorry, I have no space. Sorry, I'm looking at the fall. Sorry, I'm, and I'm saying the same thing to people. And so this is further, I'm reaching out for support and can't get it. I know I need it and I can't have it. And it's like a long game. It's not like just hold for a month. We're looking at a half a year in a lot of cases. It's, tr it's really uh, frightening because this kind of yeah. um, pervasive anxiety among our youth mm -hmm. not only will affect their lives, but will affect their children's lives. That's this is right. um, the tale yeah. of COVID, the long, mm, the, the kind of uh, changes that are happening now are not going to, we can't snap our fingers and they'll it go It won't away. show up yet until, yeah, I know it keeps rippling. Yeah. yeah which is pretty scary. Yeah. We're talking ourselves into an anxiety and to a panic attack I know. right now, Karen, which it's, is another kind of an anxiety disorder. But isn't it kind of real? Because this is, we're not overreacting. It's, no, we're not. this is, we're being really realistic about paying attention and what we know to be true in these waves of crisis. When we collectively yeah. go through these things, we collectively have ripple effects from them. This is not, we can't, we can't, pretend this isn't going to have some backlash, right? So so right. when we see those come, how are we now in, uh, preparing for them well? And how are we going to mitigate that? And, and at a big level, because we aren't talking about a certain family or a certain child or a certain city, we're talking globally. Right. Can you imagine how this is reshaping the nervous systems of the world <laughs> all at the same time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's true. And then we also understand now um, through Rachel Yehuda's work and the work that has come subsequent to her initial work uh, that that certain panicky kind of responses mm -hmm. can be encoded in DNA and passed on to children. Yes. Yeah. So not to say that kids are born with an anxiety disorder, although we talked about that a little bit, they can easily be predisposed to it, which means I never quite understood what that meant in real life, you know, to be yeah. predisposed. But as yeah. I'm watching the brain scans that are coming out of these studies, mm -hmm. I see exactly what it means. That little brain with that changed DNA, it's uh, it's just more susceptible. It's like some people get the flu yeah. more easily than others. Some people get colds yeah. more easily than others. And that's some people get anxiety more easily than others because yeah. in part because of their changed DNA, because mom mm. had um, panic disorder or uh, yeah. a kind of 
disorder that just changed her DNA. Mm -hmm. So it's, yes, it's, you're right. It's a very worrying kind of thing. And we are, um, we're having to work really hard to get a handle on Mm -hmm. it. And I hear that you are doing, you're doing the same, both with your children and in your practice. Yeah. Well, and I always think, well, we could go the hopeless route, throw our hands up in the air and go, dang, we're stuck. Here it comes. I'll just wait it out. I'll wait till it shows up and I'll be sad about it. Or we can say, yep, here it comes. Uh, How in the same way that we are primed by these lived experiences to become more anxious, we can also do things to prime ourselves to be resilient. Right. Right? And so my only choice and power and agency here is to work with strategies to be, to prime myself to be as resilient as possible, knowing that that is what's coming down the pipe. Right. Right. And I, I want that for kids. I want them to have, the ability to soothe themselves, the ability to come back to their own base ground, the the ability to, because the ability is what's going to help them show up for themselves when the circumstances can't be changed and they have to face right. them. Right. 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 So let's, let's help us and listeners to make this very practical. Yeah. So if you have a child Maybe this is a teenager now who's getting ready to graduate from high school, um, who shows all the signs of situational anxiety whenever they're under pressure, like they have to give an oral report or they have to go meet with the guidance counselor or they have to, whatever it is that feels to them like pressure, they shut down. Yeah. There's a, it's a very common response of kids who have certain kinds of anxiety disorders. If that child, teenager, can be helped to learn those techniques that you're talking about, then when they go for a job interview, they're not going to be sitting, waiting to be called into the interview, um, biting their nails down to their quick, uh, jumping up and running to the bathroom every couple of seconds, you know, or whatever. I, and, and I can just see those poor kids because we all know them. Yeah. And it's not their fault. It's nothing wrong with them. It's just something that they can't help, but it does not help them. Mm -hmm. Right. It doesn't, Mm -hmm. it's, they can't help it, but it really is not such a good thing for them. Yeah. So if we can help them have those tools, and this is one of the good things that I see coming out of the pandemic is that people are talking more and more about what does help kids who are anxious. What can we do? What tools do we give them? How do we practice them? I do a lot of work with schools and talk Mm -hmm. to teachers a lot about what you're reporting to me is the kids are not getting as much done. They're having more trouble uh, concentrating. They can't finish a project. They come in from recess and they can't settle. We have some great techniques to help with that. Mm -hmm. Let's do them. And you see some... uh, a little bit of skepticism, maybe a lot of skepticism on the part of numbers of teachers because they haven't had to do this before. And they say, well, you know, I was a good teacher before, so I can handle this. Well, this is different. And this is what I say to teachers when I'm teaching about tips, trauma-informed practices. Mm -hmm. These trauma-informed practices are necessary for kids with the kind of background that that we talk about when we do trauma work. Yeah. I consider COVID to be trauma inducing for many kids. Yeah. Yeah. So I say to teachers, yes, these are techniques that we need. These are tips, trauma informed practices that we need for those kids, but they're good for all kids. That's right. And they're good for all parents and they're good for yeah. all of us. And they just help us to keep that, I'm going to go back to the uh, to the picture in my mind that I have of playing tag at home as a kid, mm-hmm. you know, staying out till it I got dark that. and yeah. <laughs> poor parents would have to come out and drag us in. But there I would be holding onto that tree like I'm home free. Yeah. I made it. I'm safe. I can take a breath. I can laugh. I can have a good time mm-hmm. with this. Then I can go out and be anxious again, which is really mm-hmm. in, in a game sense. It's more being excited. Um, and and have that thrill, but my adrenaline's up. I'm still kind of 
anxious. It's like being chased by a bull, you know, but I know that I can go back to that tree and take a deep breath. And those are the techniques that we're helping people learn right now, Mm -hmm. which address the kind of trauma that we're seeing with anxiety producing um, situation around us all the time. Yeah. You know, I, I love the school approach because that is hitting so many kids where they're at so much of the time. And while I can appreciate some teachers feeling like, it's okay, I've got this for this year, right? I can get my kids through this year. That's not actually what we're talking about. We're talking about how do we as educators in a really powerful position to help kids partner with their own nervous systems to equip them for their lives about managing anxiety. This is not, right? And because this is now... It matters to more kids because they've had this disruptive crisis in their life that has tipped a bandwidth of kids from just making it through to we're not making it through. It's that much more important that we look at this from a systemic perspective. How do we enter our systems of care, right? So how do physicians treat this differently? How do teachers treat this differently? If we all partner because we are so well positioned, right? to Mm -hmm. influence and teach kids because they're our captive audience. It makes so much sense that what I'm going to teach my kid today is just as central as life skills for math and for science and for, right? This is, this is critical to coping, to being able to show up to a job interview when my kid in my class is five years from now showing up for that job interview. Yeah. And I used to say, this is a gift that you're giving your kids, whether I was talking to yeah. parents or teachers or whoever it is, this is a gift yeah. that you're giving them. I don't say that anymore because now it's necessary. This is mm. a tool. And I think you used that yeah. term, but this is a yeah. necessary tool that we are teaching our kids. If mm-hmm. we didn't need to read, we probably wouldn't teach it. We didn't use yeah, to teach that's these right. skills, but now yeah we really do need to teach these skills. And the really beautiful part of it is, Karen, as at least as far as I'm concerned, the beautiful part of it is they're attachment-based to begin with. Mm-hmm. They're relationship-based. Right. Yeah. They're yeah. all about how can we work together? How can I help you? Yeah. How can you show me? Let's have fun together. Let's take care of each other, which is in the best sense the good thing that's coming out of COVID. The alternative is kids are becoming more withdrawn. They're going more into Mm -hmm. their electronics. They're becoming Mm -hmm. addicted at highly, very scary rates to, um, to gaming to, and and of course um, rates of other types of addictions are also going up. So when they, when kids don't have a strong relationship or even when they do, they have to fight that much harder to use their relationships to keep them safe, to keep them healthy. Yeah. Yeah. But if people are given tools about how to be with kids mm-hmm. so that it is fun, so the kids will want to come back, they will open up, they will want to try a little bit harder to just learn what right now feels kind of hard to learn, which is we're yeah. we're we're gonna be okay. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it. But we're yep. going to be okay. So let's practice those skills that allow us to get to that place that says, I don't have to be anxious all the time mm-hmm. because right now, right here, I'm safe. I'm okay. And the world is good. Right for this minute, I can do that. Yeah. Well, and, as, you know, I'm glad you brought up the addiction rates because this is, you know, how we have learned over time as professionals to understand the root of addiction. It's Mm -hmm. the opposite of connection or it's the opposite of having the internal ability to find safety within yourself. So when you don't have that, naturally you reach for something that will give it to you. We know that what we get addicted to are the numbing agents that help us live inside ourselves, right? When the world inside ourselves feels untenable, we cannot sit in that. It's too uncomfortable. To survive myself, I need something to help me, right? And so when when we bridge that back to any level of of manageable, in that realm of anxiety that we see in kids that we think, 
it still seems pretty manageable. We get through. This is the target time. This is the time we equip our kids so that they don't yeah. lose themselves in the coming years and feel like it's so beyond what I can manage that I need something outside of myself to help me out. Right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And you're right that this is the time to do it. Yeah. While they're learning, regardless of whether they were born with a predisposition or the situation around them just became so impossible for them for so long. It's kind of how I describe this to parents sometimes, especially adoptive parents or foster parents who don't know exactly what happened with their kids mm -hmm. before they came to their parents. Mm -hmm. And I say, whatever the situation was, it was too big and too yep. intense for too long. Yes. And so what this child learned was, I, 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 I can't do this. Mm -hmm. Whatever that this is, um, I can't connect. I can't behave. I can't love myself. I can't relax. Whatever that this yeah. is, it's because things were too tough for too long and too intense. So yeah. if for some kids who are kind of borderline before COVID and then now they couldn't see their friends, now they couldn't have the physical activity they were used to, now they can't uh, engage in the regular fun activities that they had before. Now they hear their parents being worried about losing a job. Now they worry about mm -hmm. losing their home. I mean, the numbers of things that kids have gone through yeah. over the last few years and when they... They, they don't have a frame of reference to say, oh, isn't this the way the world is? That's right. Oh, well, if this is the way the world is, I, I, I just better step up here and be worried. That's right. Yep. Because I don't know what else I can be do. Be on guard. That's right. Yeah. 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 And I, you know, I would like to, you know, I, I appreciate when you came on and asked for clarification, are we focused on the kids or are we looking at everybody here? And this is where I think we, we can't draw a false line because- yeah. As soon as we talk about, for instance, the in utero experiences, I immediately think, man, the guilt we feel mm -hmm. for having all we want is our kids to thrive. That is built into our parenting wiring box. Yeah. We are not going out of our way to make things hard for our kids. And when we talk focused on the the impacts of the kids, I think that's when we go, oh my gosh, what have I done? Like yeah. all that stress that I was under while I was pregnant or all that stress I was under for the first three years of my kid's newborn life. If I had only been able to, you know, and I think, but this is the thing we, nobody is immune to the world. We don't get to say, well, if I lived in a perfect world, <laughs> You know, I should have lived in a perfect world. Like, why yeah, didn't we I choose that? Say. You never <laughs> yeah. got to say that, right? And so I, I just mm -hmm. want to go there for a second to, to help come alongside parents in recognizing that you too were under the gun. You too, whatever circumstances led to creating that environment that meant your child had to be in a hypervigilant state of anxiety is likely the same thing you were under that created your anxiety that got passed on. This wasn't that you, you could have done anything different, right? So then what do we do to equip our kids in managing that as a template for then how we manage anything else they encounter in the world? Because nobody can escape it. Yeah. Nobody can escape the situations that are anxiety provoking. Yeah. They're there, right? right. Yep. And for and so many right. reasons, we, we have these other layers of things that stop us, right? It's even yeah. way outside of ourselves. You yeah. know, if you are a marginalized like person, if you are impoverished, if you are have a history of addiction, if your parents had a history of it, if you have all sorts of things will stop you. Right. Yeah. Right. And I do, I mean, this is not a political platform, but certainly in the U.S., we have to say racial. Absolutely. I mean, you, can't, you can't decide what color you're born. No. And you can't undo that once it's done. So yeah. it, it should be mixed into the whole mix of what are all the things against me 
and you named a whole bunch of them. And if you look mm-hmm. at the ACE study, you can name, uh, you know, a whole lot more. Yep. That's My right. parents had mental health issues. There was uh, addiction in the family. There were mm-hmm. mental health issues in the family. I mean, the, the list is there and you're born into that. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as someone helps you understand the value of relationship, healthy relationship, mm-hmm. then you can begin to see that there is some hope for you to uh, to be a resilient person. Yeah. But it's pretty hard to be resilient if you don't understand how to use relationships to help you, how to enjoy the benefits of relationships of people who want to help you. So, and that's where the majority of my practice has been over the years is, Mm. you know, there are kids who are afraid of for very good reason or resistant to for very good reason. I tend to be a no fault person. We're not looking for trouble here. Nobody's at fault for this. This is just as you say, you're born into. So, okay, here's the situation I'm born into this. Now, what can I do about it? Yeah. How can I help? And who can help me? So then we get to the point of, you know, if it's a teacher who helps you feel like you, you, you got this, you can do this. And I'm here to help you if you have trouble. Yeah. All of a sudden, a little window might open up in your busy little anxious brain that says, really, I I, I can do this. And she or he sees that. That's Mm -hmm. wow. I'm not sure I believe it yet. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to try it. I'll borrow your and, confidence. Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. And he or she is there in case I fall down. Wow. Well, yeah. that makes it that much easier. So um, just recently I was at a um, at a intermediate school. I think they have fourth through sixth grade kids. And there was a child who um, was so anxious and then had become so depressed about being so anxious for so long because... Mm-hmm. It's exhausting. Yeah, to be feels anxious hopeless. Yeah, yeah, hopeless. And he pretty much shut down. Mm-hmm. And they, the the teachers asked me to come in and talk with them about how to help. And my question was, did he have friends? Before all this became so difficult for him, did he have yeah. friends? Oh, yes, he has a buddy. Is the buddy still there? Oh, yes. Is the buddy still willing to help? Oh, yes. Well, it doesn't have to be us adults. We can help empower kids to help other kids. Now, my caution is, and this is what I said to the school, make sure that this other child, this this buddy child's parents are aware of what mm-hmm. we're asking of this buddy, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. God help us if anything happens to this child. Yeah. And then we've got a buddy who is feeling guilty about something that is not his fault. Right. Yeah. Everybody needs to be on board with this. In fact, mm-hmm. it should be an open conversation. Mm-hmm. with everybody involved. But the point is that we don't have to bear all the work if we right. empower kids to do a lot of this themselves at the appropriate age level and the appropriate um, developmental level. We don't want to yes. ask kids to do stuff that's above their pay grade, as it were. You know, yes. They can't do it yet. Right. Well, and equip them with support. It's not go in yes. the lion's den and and we'll yeah. leave. It's <laughs> we're standing right here supporting <laughs> right. you as well, right? It's a team. Yes. It's a team. And, and I'm sure you hear this too. Sometimes parents will say, "Well, you know, they've got to learn because they're going to have to." Know. Well, now hold on a second. Mm-hmm. You don't you don't ask your kids to go out and direct traffic, do you? Well, yeah. no. Well, that's right because there are things that they are ready to do developmentally. Yeah and not ready to do developmentally. And your job as a parent is not to teach them how to be developmentally somewhere that they're not. They're not there yet. Enjoy Mm -hmm. them where they are, make the most of where they are, um, and teach them the things that are appropriate for that developmental stage. And part of that, which we, I don't know, I fear that we have lost this to a great degree, is the ability and the, the systemic use of play with our kids. Yes. We used to play yep. with our kids. Even, yep. even to the point of things like, you know, living on a farm, because we were very agrarian people and we would live on farms together, right? And the kids would have to work. But sometimes my grandmother, my great grandmother was a farmer and I, we used to spend summers with her and I used to watch. Sometimes mm-hmm. you have a race to see who can get more eggs. 
Yeah. Uh, it can be done in a playful way. Yeah. 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 Or who's yeah. going to pitch more hay that day or mm-hmm. not to say that it's fun to work. That's why they call it work, but yep. you can have yeah. some fun with it. And what it teaches is collegiality. It teaches mm-hmm. joy. It changes mm-hmm. your hormones and in, inside of you when you start to play yeah. and sets you up for more happiness because those hormones say to you, okay, it's not all bad. There's some joy yeah. in life and that's yeah. a good thing. Uh, so yeah. I don't know. I encourage parents to play. Absolutely. Yeah. There's there's something partnering in that and there's an exchange that can happen. So it yeah. isn't parallel. And as soon as we just demand something and then walk away, that's parallel. That's I have an expectation of you that you can go do that solo as opposed to let's do these things together. Let's create learning together. Let us both. And there's a synergy in that, right? There is. There's, there, there's, yeah. and you take that away when there's this divide. There is no opportunity for that in between us stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And kids need that in between. You stuff. know what we ought to do, Karen? Let's do this. Let's find cartoons that express in visual form what we're talking yeah. about. Like I'm picturing a cartoon that I remember from when I was a kid of a teacher with her arms folded, staring down at the kids. And I think in one hand, she even had a ruler. Yeah. And I think about that sometimes when I feel, or I did, especially when my kids were young, when I felt like I was being dictatorial. And I would think about that cartoon. I wish I had cut it out and kept it that yeah. says, yeah, you don't, you don't, that's no fun. It's not fun Mm -hmm. for the parent and it's not fun for the kids for sure. So um, maybe we could, um, I don't know, get a little folder where we can put cartoons and ask your your listeners to also send theirs in and we could um, make them available. But cartoons, I think have a great, I always wanted to teach a a course um, in psychology in which cartoons or comics Comics, I guess, is what I mean to say, were yeah. the subject because they mm-hmm. take humanity and they look at it in a in a different way. Mm-hmm. They capture so much of what goes on inside of us in a humorous way or a poignant way. Um, anyway, that's an it's a little bit of a mirror, need, right? We get that. to put. Yeah, no, I like it. We put something in picture form and it helps us relate to that differently. And I think that too allows us to separate ourselves and see the humor in it. Because Mm -hmm. when it feels really personal, parents are very quick to go to, oh, I'm doing this wrong. Oh, I feel bad. Well, like I were defensive. Like I had, well, I had to, what choice did I have? I have to toughen Mm -hmm. them up or I have to. And when we realize what it looks like out there, apart from us, we see the like, okay, I get why that's not going to work. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> or oh, okay yeah. I'd attack that differently now if I had it right I get why that felt good at yeah. the time but that's probably not the greatest idea yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah that I mean we see that break. captured in uh, often like uh we'll post a meme or something or you know on my in, uh, Instagram account just to to kind of poke the fun at our parenting choices sometimes but also the circumstances that put us in a bind where we feel like we make those silly choices. Like I make those crazy choices all the time. And when I step back, I, what the heck was I thinking? Well, I, I know thinking? what I was thinking. If I go back and look, I'm like, well, I mean, really, what choice did I have? I was just like, <laughs> okay, well, or just can I pair of- that? <laughs> and parenting is exhausting too. And, you know, sometimes <laughs> we just say, I was just tired and okay, I did it. It's over. We'll move on. <sighs> But yes, good to take a breath. Yeah, I agree. it is good to take a breath. And it, it helps us remember, we cannot be perfect. Right. And our kids don't need us to be they actually benefit from us not being because we in part get to model what it's like to make mistakes and repair them. Yes. And without making mistakes, there's nothing to model repair for. So we want our kids to experience that from someone who is safe and connected to us. So I don't want to rob them of that. That's what I think. Yeah, every mistake you make is a gift to your child. So we get. Oh, I like that. Then how are you going to use it? Right? How are you going to yep. use it? And, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. It is good. Okay. So before we before we wrap up, I would like some clarity, if you can, to help us to help parents know when 
anxiety, where the, on that continuum of healthy anxiety to not healthy anxiety. So healthy to functional to not functional. What does it look like for the kids who sit right on the line where we can kind of say, okay, what was working in their best interest has now crossed into it's interfering. It's, it's getting in the way of life. How, how can parents measure that or notice that? What does it look like? Well, you asked the tough questions, Karen. I know. When I get you on the line, I'm like, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna deliver the tough ones. I and, know and that really there's no the exact this. thing, but there's examples, right? right? You're so realistic yeah. and and practical, and good at painting pictures for parents about what it means on the ground. So if a parent is, you know, so I think about scenarios like last year, um, my more reserved child decided on day one of school, she's never had this issue, but she's always been on the more cautious side of life. And so it doesn't totally surprise me, but it seemed out of character for her when she said in the hallway, in tears, I'm not going to, I'm not going to school today. I'm not going. And the fight response came out in her. She was doubling down and there was nothing I could do to make her get out that door. And that was a moment for me where I, my anxious parent spidey senses went, oh crap, are we in for a tough year? Like I right away generalized to we're going to, oh no, this is an indicator of my next while, right? She's, this is going to be a disaster year. Um, and it turned out that we coached through that day and it was a tough day. And then the next day she felt equipped. Okay. I know now what the campus looks like. I know now right. who my teacher is. I know now. I got the data I needed to help me feel like I was capable of going and facing that tomorrow. But in the moment there was no convincing her that she would be able to do that. Right. And so yeah. how many of those need to happen for a parent to go, we have a real problem on our hands, you know? So the first caution I think I would have for parents is this, if there's a big change, and you alluded to this early on mm -hmm. in, our, in our talk, Karen, if there's a mm -hmm. dramatic change in behavior, check it out because yeah. that's not okay. If your child is now not sleeping, not eating well, if bathrooming has changed, mm -hmm. um, if communication has changed, if uh, willingness to participate in activities has changed. If those things are different, or mm -hmm. if over time they have become pervasive during your child's life. I, I, I remember talking to a parent whose child was now in, um, actually he was in college at this point, and he came home from college and they had a, a discussion one weekend about what his life was like before he went away. His mom was saying, you know, you were afraid to go to college, how is it? Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I learned that I had to tackle some things head on and I've been practicing them and I can do them. And she said, oh, wonderful. Like what? And he said, well, I used to lie in bed for like an hour or two before I could go to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. And she said, what? You mean when you were home? And he said, yes, I know you didn't know that and I never bothered mm -hmm. you with it. Yeah. But it was the beginning of a discussion for that family that was not just eye-opening and guilt-producing for the mother, even though, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, we, the I should have known that. comes up there. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can't we can't do that. We'll waste our whole lives every time we make a yeah. mistake or don't That's know right. something. Yeah. Right. But <clears throat> it opened up a lot of discussion about his anxiety when he was young. And she said, well, what did you used to think about? And he said, I used to lie there and ruminate about everything that had happened during the day. And what, what did that mean? And why did I look stupid? And how come I did it that way? And, uh, but never about how can I ask for help so I don't do that again? And that's yeah. the tool that I'm talking about. Yes. One of the tools that I'm helping, I'm talking about helping kids to learn how to master their own worry or anxiety. Mm -hmm. Anxiety is a excessive worry about stuff. So, um, so my suggestion to parents is this. If you decide that you want to try this yourself, because it's not at the point that you're afraid of, you know, this mm -hmm. being really dangerous for your kids yet, um, try some of those tools, look them up online, or I'll give you a few right now. One of them is 
color with your kids. Coloring is by nature anxiety reducing for most kids. None of these are 100% for all kids. Yeah. But for most kids, coloring is a good thing. Color with them. You don't have to talk. You don't have yep. to make it a big deal. Just yeah. sit down and do it together. Introduce the activity. That, make it available. Yeah. Yes. And if that, if you see that that helps them relax, you have an indication that, you know what, maybe this is not pervasive yet. Maybe this mm-hmm. is not generalized anxiety disorder. And maybe it's something that we can work on. A second yep. thing would be to employ some mindfulness activities. And these are things that I yeah. encourage parents to do as often as they can and teachers to do. So when yeah. they're talking about their kids coming in from recess and they can't settle down, I wish I had it right here. I would do it. Let me see if this will work. I say to them, keep a bell on your desk and hit yeah. the bell when they walk in and say, raise your hand when you can't hear the bell ringing anymore. They have to listen. They yeah. have to focus. They have to yeah. concentrate. It's not something they're used to doing. Like, listen to right. my voice. I'm telling yeah. you, you have to sit yeah, down. Yeah, no. yeah, 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 yeah. Listening to a bell. But there are a ton of those kinds of very small techniques mm. that you can use to help your kids practice settling down. If yeah. over time some of them are working, that's a good indication that this is not a generalized anxiety disorder, at least not yet. Yeah. Uh, Another thing that is critically important, of course, is breathing exercises. And um, if you can help your kids do breathing activities, and just as I'm saying it, I'm taking a deep breath. We, um, there's something in our brains called um, mirror neurons. And it Mm -hmm. means when you see somebody else do something, you, without thinking about it, you (laughs) mimic the same thing. Yeah. Breathing is one of those things that often comes up as a mirror neuron activity. So yeah. Whew, <sighs> if you just take a deep breath or a yawn yeah. and let your shoulders go, very often your kids will too. Yeah. Practice that. Be mindful yeah. of that and do it as much as you can. It's good for you as a parent. It's good for you as a teacher. It's really good for kids to see you doing that and, and hear mm-hmm. you doing that. As I mentioned before, games. If you can engage a child in a game. So when you're talking about your daughter having trouble going to school that day. Uh, mm-hmm. two ideas and I hear that you yeah. mastered it. So that's great. No, but I want to um, know what, what, yeah. What are the things we do when we get caught in those right. moments that are unexpected and they feel and big. this moment because it's, because it was unexpected, this wouldn't help. But when you have, mm-hmm. when you know you have an anxious child, tell them or show them or actually do with them as much as you can about what they're going to be doing. So for example, if they're going to um, a friend's birthday party and they're anxious about what it would be like, talk to the friend's mother and say, what are the activities you're going to do? And tell your child about them ahead. You might even take them if they haven't been to that house before. Take them over, ask permission to go to the house and look around. A lot of anxiety is because it's unknown and if you mm-hmm. take that part of the anxiety away, it allows a child right. to be more engaged in the activity. So I used to mention to um, newly adoptive parents or foster parents a lot, take your child to school before school starts. Let them run around in the playground, run around mm-hmm. in the playground with them. Mm-hmm. Have a fun activity at the school before they have to go to the school. Ask yep. permission of the school to bring them inside, to show them their classroom. Mm-hmm. And anticipating with them and for them what things might be like can often help anxiety. Yeah. And I'm giving suggestions because these are also indicators of whether or not it, this will help a child. And that can give you clues. Is this situational or generalized? Because yeah. if they can't take advantage of any of these um, tools or mm-hmm. types of things that can help a lot of kids then maybe you're looking at uh, a generalized anxiety situation where you really do want to take them right away. It's beyond manageable. Yeah. 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 I also want to say um, that it's very important for us, for all of us, for parents, teachers, kids, to keep ourselves physically active and hydrated. And we, we minimize that and we shouldn't. Yeah. 
Physiologic activity and hydration are critically important to keeping our anxiety levels in check. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about it a lot, but no, we don't. No. And hydration is a big one because it's huge. The more we're anxious, the more we use up fluid in our brain, the more dried out our brain becomes. And yeah. the, I love the expression, lotion is motion. I mean, motion is lotion, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Motion is lotion. Well, movement and drinking can really help our bodies and our brains to be more yeah. relaxed, more active, more um, able to do what we need them to do for us. Mm -hmm. So just yeah. keep make sure that your kids' water bottles are filled up. Yeah. Um, if they don't well, like to drink it, water. Like, it's interesting because when you, uh, this is what I think a lot of, I, I experience this, but a lot of parents experience is they hear things that feel so removed from the science. So it feels mm -hmm. like we've, we've done all the p small steps toward extrapolating why this matters, right? From, from the yeah. evidence to the, why this is happening in our body. And we understand that. And so it makes sense to us to just jump to the strategy, yeah. just do that. That's helpful. Right. And parents are like, really, how is water going to help my kid mm -hmm. not do school refusal? Right? Mm -hmm. right. So just to yeah. pause there for a second, it has been helpful for me to imagine when your stress signals are responding to your physiology, your body is giving itself cues if the environment is safe or not. And if your body is under internal stress from being dehydrated, that is a survival signal, right? So yep. you're, it is causing you to be in a stress state and and then your stress state says, quick, get to safety. And that does not have a brain. It just has a nervous system. The nervous yes. system can't decipher what's safe and what's not. It can't rationalize. So if it feels it's not safe, it doesn't ask why. It just says, get safe, period, mm -hmm. right? So if you're dehydrated, it doesn't mean anything different to your nervous system than a dog is coming running at me and biting me. It, it They're the same cues that our body are wired to say, look out, you're in danger level. Mm -hmm. With kids, I have found it helpful to explain that in gaming terms. If you, if you are doing some kind of role play game, you have a person with a life and the bar gets lower and lower and lower of your, of your stamina, because you haven't eaten enough. You haven't drank enough. You haven't collected enough fish from the pond to sustain Left you on enough. your journey. You haven't. And as that bar goes down, the heart starts to beat faster at the end yeah. to signal warning, 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 go take care of your basic needs. Right. Right. Cause you can't yeah. fight the battle that's coming if you haven't taken care of your resources. Right. Yeah. So replenish. And I think that when you speak about that, I think, yeah, I really want parents to get why that's important. Mm -hmm. It's really yeah, internally, basically important for them. Yeah. 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 Agreed. So, so mm -hmm. yes. So it's really incumbent on us as adults to make sure that kids have enough to drink on a regular basis. And, you know, during COVID when all the water fountains were shut down because we couldn't yep. drink from the same water fountains, uh, it was very difficult. And I used to say to, to the school administrators, you need to empower teachers to make sure that these kids have enough time to go get water or to bring it into yeah. the room, um, yeah. into their classrooms. And it's, it's, it's not something that we normally think about. We just no. do it. So yep. we have to talk about it. We have to make yeah. accommodations for it. So all of these things are, are things like, so, um, we used to sometimes have find that there were kids who didn't want to come into therapy sessions. They were afraid. Yeah. And for many of them, it was understandable. Um, we used to see kids who were at the end of their parents' rope, you know, like this is, this is mm -hmm. getting to be too much. We've already had therapy and it didn't work. Now we're coming to you as a last resort. And these kids of course didn't want to come in. Yeah. So I would go out in the waiting room or one of us would go out and play just just take the kids' hands as long as they were okay with that and play mm -hmm. Ring Around the Rosie into the therapy room. Yeah. When you go to a game um, sense, 
you know, now we're playing something. Yes. It's different from you have to come into the therapy room, just right. as you were talking about before. Uh, yeah. It's it's an engagement thing. It's a relationship thing. It's a fun thing. And um, if you can do that with your kids, you can get a, mm -hmm. a lot farther with them. And if they can engage with you, it's an indication that this may not be a generalized anxiety. This may be situational. Mm -hmm. And the more you can do it, the more they're practicing now, feeling like they're home free, feeling yeah. like they're at home base. And they can You're take You're entering a safe state with them, right? Exactly. So it's like, I'm going to provide you with the playful opportunity. Yeah. And if you are capable of engaging in that play with mm -hmm. me, then we can tell we're, this is workable. Yeah, You are able to go from high stress to low stress. You can move down that ladder, right? That's, it's within yeah. your ability to do it. Yeah. And okay. then, and then you, can, if you know that that's true, then you can start practicing some of the other activities yeah. like the cognitive behavioral therapy, things that you can actually learn from a therapist and practice mm -hmm. with your kids. You can learn things like when your child is, they can begin to report to you. I'm beginning to get nervous. I don't like yeah. what we're doing right yeah. now. Yeah. Read the cues. That, yeah. Yes. And, and they can't do that mm -hmm. when all they're doing is feeling. They that's don't right. understand that. They don't recognize that there's another way to be. Mm -hmm. And so once they begin to understand, oh, I don't always have to feel that way. How can you help me, mom or our dad? What what can I do instead when I start to feel this way? Well, let's go out and run around the block. And I bet that'll help. Yeah. And it yeah. often, maybe right. very often does help. Yeah. So lots of things. You can find them online. You can talk to a therapist. You can ask mm -hmm. um, your pediatrician or uh, medical providers. What are things that we can do? But if kids don't respond to any of them, it's a good clue mm -hmm. that you really need to get help quickly because mm -hmm. generalized anxiety disorder is treatable, but you want to get it stubborn. as soon as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. I so appreciate your time. We definitely got two episodes out of this. And I I love, again, always, as always, how in-depth you can go, but how practical you keep it. And thank you. Thank you for talking to me again today. This is my joy. This is my joy. Love this it. is, Aww. other than my, my family, this is what I love <laughs> just the most. Good. Any way that we can help parents be the best they can be so that their kids can be happy, adjusted, productive, and fun. Yeah. Very wonderful thing. That's Good for you for doing is. this. Thank you, Karen. Aww, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>